Connors T. How are ye? Welcome to the Candle of Tales podcast. My name is Aaron and I'm sitting down in the shafas with my sister. My name is Sarika and I'm sitting down in the shafas with my brother. And this week we're going to have an extended conversation about on Thorn Bow Kunla, the cattle raid of Cooley, which we released in a five part series just last week and the week before and the week before and the week before you don't have to do all five I mean we'll be here all day I literally just ended it was intended to be over the month of November but it it slid slightly into December I mean it's still a Patreon appreciation month it's just not the month of a particular yeah 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 no it was it was five weeks of Patreon appreciation yeah yeah yeah. vaguely tied to the month of November vaguely but not quite but like we started in November December it's our five week anniversary five we do, year we do I mean, have a five week long anniversary because none of us can remember the actual date that we I started genuinely on genuinely have no clue like. also I know it was a Monday night but like which Monday I don't know it was it was five years ago like do you remember exactly when you were born five years ago no because if you are five <laughs> you're not listening to this and you don't know when you were born yeah <laughs> Five year olds shouldn't be listening to this. Where are your parents if you're five? Go I mean, and get your parents and yeah. tell them that the sweary siblings are on and you shouldn't be allowed. Oh no, it'd be a grand, it'd be a grand show. We got a lo- lovely show out old. there. I, sh- I, I, I specifically told people I'd cut back the swearing. Um, well, that's that you said that. I, I literally spoke, I also said I can't speak for my sister though. Well, that you were correct, weren't you? <laughs> Um, right, we're going to get to the time. We're going to start talking about the in-depth stuff and the analysis and all that crack because there's a lot going on and we're going to have in this whole extended chat because the last few podcasts, we didn't have any chat at all. We had no little bit of a how are you getting on and, and a figure it out and all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do now is actually remind you why we did that five thing, which was basically part of our appreciation month. Yes. So... Patreon uh, is the way that we fund this podcast or the way that we are beginning to fund this podcast. So if you go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales, you can see on our milestones, which I've recently updated, what things we're covering and what things we're not covering. On it. On it. So on it, man. Um, Yeah, because I kind of thought I was kind of thinking through how to restructure that recently. But basically, it shows you what we're covering, and what we're not covering. Now, I got to say, November was like a bit of a stretch for us. Uh, Yeah, because it was a busy month anyway. But it also because we'd set ourselves the goal of putting out a podcast every week. Yeah, it's cold and like your energy. The main thing really is not cold or November (laughs) or energy. I know. The main thing is time. Yeah, that's true. Because we all have to work. So we all have to work to pay rent and pay our bills and we're trying to put out a podcast every week. And that's actually, that's quite tough. Actually, like, because between like the recording, the editing, the music, the uploading and Oshin's out there in Wicla. With a terrible terrible internet connection. Um, So like, that's just kind of the thing that became (laughs) clearer. Like we know it already. Like it's, this was something that we started Candle of Tales with five years ago was like, whenever you're working in the arts in Ireland and I think everywhere else. People always try and get you to do stuff like for the exposure. Oh, yeah. For free, that in other words. Not. Which doesn't work. No. Nah. Um, the greatest retort to that I ever read was like, name the artist who, who did the portrait on the uh, American $1 bill. Because that's the most exposed piece of art probably in the world. Michelangelo, isn't it? Sure are. <laughs> he was a contemporary of Benjamin Franklin. Ten, yeah. Or whoever the hell is on the $1 bill. I actually uh, don't know. That's right what now. I read. <laughs> So, yeah, it doesn't work. Lincoln? I think it was Lincoln. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm very wrong. I shouldn't answer these questions. Um, I'm Funny, not. it wasn't a question. Mm. Actually, just trying to finish my sentence here. Carry on. I wasn't interrupting. Uh, no, you sure weren't. Um, I've now lost my train of thought. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Cheers. She's Cheers, buddy. She's doing Cheers. sisterly glare thing. She's doing. I'm not even looking at you. No, You're dead to she's me. She's glaring at the desk, which is even more terrifying. I'm a younger brother. I'm terrified. And yet... Um, he still talks <laughs> so we are very basically appreciative of the people that are supporting us right now because what we've managed to do is basically cover our costs we're doing this in a essentially a bit of a voluntary basis but we're getting enough money to pay for the equipment it's you know it's a little month that goes a long way because it, it comes together we're able to buy equipment uh, heat the office you know kind of buy 
Yeah, you can see all of, of that on the list yeah. that's on Patreon. Yeah, yeah. That's that breaks down where we're at in terms of that. You can also see what we'd like to do in the future. True. And what we'll be able to do in the future with more funding if we ever get it or if, if enough people kind of listen to this and want to contribute to it and support it, what our goals are for the future. So goals like, you know, scoring these with more than one musician, which mm -hmm. takes extra time and actual composition and Sounds takes great when it's done. much more work. Uh, getting into recording studios to record CD versions of the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, studio versions of the stories, which we've actually started with The Shadows of the Tone. But again, because that isn't something that we're able to fund at the moment, that is currently done on a voluntary basis, which means whenever everybody has a, a free day to go out and do it. Um, so basically, everything is slowed down uh, and everything can be accelerated with a bit of cash. So that's why we're kind of asking for it. That's our philosophy behind it as well, always, was we didn't want to ask other performers to perform with us for free. No. Because if we'd asked people to do that five years ago, we wouldn't still be going. And it's kind of like, uh, as a performer, as an actor, as a voiceover person, like, I get asked to do a lot of stuff for free. And my answer used to be, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then you just run ragged doing favours yeah. for people. So I've just kind of come, come up with, like, you know, okay, I can do the thing, but literally what it is is my livelihood, so... What's the, you know, the yeah, there has to be a benefit. Uh, and that was kind of the thing as well. Like, you know, a lot of people are really enthused by stories and storytelling and want to get involved and want to help. And I've always been like, that's great, but enthusiasm can't sustain you. Hmm. You need to be able to actually put something else behind it. So that's why we, we kind of, you know, and have developed the model that we have in terms of funding and paying people. In and the something else as well is also sharing and liking and spreading word and listening. Like because that's oh, yeah. part of it's the support. support you know? And like the the reason that we have flat uh, tiers on Patreon, like there are, there are a lot of Patreons where the more you pay, the more you get. We decided not to do that in our Patreon because we just said, look, we trust you guys that if you can afford to support us, you will. And if you want to support us, you will support us the amount that you're able to. Sure. Um, and like whatever amount you're able to give is enough for us. So basically listening is great if that's all you do uh be no point telling stories without an audience to listen to them absolutely all right well without further ado we're gonna have a little chat about the thorn so this is the old story the calorate of cooley and it was the first introduction that i had to irish mythology because it was surika reading me this story about oh, I Cougar. Read it to you. you read me the <laughs> no, i didn't i told it to you did you not read it? No, I didn't read it. I thought you read it. I read a I read a version of the Tawn when I was in my teens by uh, an author who is I think Irish, but she's got a Welsh surname and I can never pronounce it because it's got the two L's in it. It's written like it's Morgan Llewellyn, but I don't. I I think there's Always a like cl sound that you do in Welsh, and I don't know how it's how it's done. So with apologies to Morgan Llewellyn, which is not her surname. Um, <laughs> that was it's kind of like written as a romance novel. Yeah. And I read that in my teens. It was called On Raven's Wing. And it's actually a good version really, of yeah. the dawn. It's very good. I then started reading it only halfway through because once you get to the halfway point, it all it just becomes turns into very sexy, sexy. bleakly tragic. But there's a whole sexy thing with uh, Mimer and Kukula. How do you know that? I read it. Did you? Yeah, did you? I didn't know you ever read that. Uh, why would I skip the sexy, sexy bit when I was a teenager? Because you were telling your younger brother about it. Yeah, no, I didn't read it this is my point I didn't read it to you okay anyway and I go. didn't I didn't like when I was rereading it for myself right okay I'd go yeah. up to the halfway the, you, you're, you're inserting yourself into the story right the sorry yeah, yeah okay yeah, sorry yeah. I'll, I'll remove standard, myself standard remove myself um, <laughs> no no I, I that was where I first read the kind of complete Ku Cullen story and that was also around the time when you were becoming um, particularly uh, loud <laughs> Shut him up. How do you shut him up? Tell him a story. Yeah. It worked. Uh, it did work. So I used to tell you stories. I think actually my memory of it is that the first time I told you a story, the first time I actually remember telling you a story, because I used to read to you a bit when mm. you were a kid. Um, the first time I remember, I remember telling you an Irish myth was when we were getting a bus up to see our grandparents in Monaghan <laughs> and the bus broke down. Oh, God. And you were not 
yet old enough. Now, I was kind of a young teen at that, at that point because you were not yet old enough to have a particularly good grasp of time. Right. So I'd say you were around six or seven. Yeah. Which would have put me like, you know, kind of 12, 13 yeah. kind of age. I think it was kind of like a big enough deal that I was minding you on the bus. Oh. Um, and the bus broke down and you needed to pee. <laughs> and so the, I think we were sitting there for about two hours. And I kept telling you <laughs> that we would start moving again in five minutes. Great one, yeah. And then I would tell you another bit of the story, which kept you distracted for a period of time. And then you'd go back to, oh, when are we going to get there? I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I'm in. And I would go, in five minutes, do you want to hear the next bit? And then you, you did. And I would tell you the next bit. So that's my memory of how I first were watched we, the story. Were we locked on the bus? And it was broken down and he wouldn't let us off. That's terrible. I don't remember. I do. I do remember being on a train with you as a kid, and I let you go. I like you wandered off to go to the bathroom, and then you went the wrong way on the train, mm. and couldn't find me. Mm. And I was like, "Wow!" I didn't think I had to wait outside the jacks for this child. But apparently, I did. That's mm. what I should have done. You yeah. nearly got off on a stop in the middle of Ireland, <laughs> and he was never seen. <laughs> like, I mean, that's why we have to mind were, children's you were, That's it's why. That's why I think it's exactly what I was doing. It's like, no, Mister fucking wanders off. You can't get out of the bus in the middle of the countryside and go for a slash in the bushes and then wander away, never to be seen again. You were some fucking kid for getting lost. I did. I got lost in Greece. <sighs> you got lost on Crete. It was Crete. an island. They shut the fucking ports down for you. Um, and yeah. it turned out you were grand. You just wandered off. I, I was fine. Everyone else had a freak attack. I, I was. I was also fine. I was in a pool and did not know what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> it was our parents who were having an absolute conniption. Yeah, yeah. They were. They were freaking out entirely. As was apparently every every Everybody adult at Crete. Else. I got um, back. I remember getting back. I do. Have, I have a visual memory of that walking up the, to the hotel, getting to our hotel, going, "Where the fuck is everybody?" And then our neighbours, who were like an English couple and a whole family, went, "There he is! Come on, quick, let's go! Everyone's looking for you." They probably didn't sound like that, but anyway, <laughs> we got down and like it was just people up on piles of rubbish, looking under rocks and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. They full on thought you were like snatched. Yeah, just, Tony just dead. Tony had the taken argument. He's like, "I will never stop." Oh yeah, yeah. No, our dad was, was he was he was full on like he had already planned out how he was going to mortgage the house. <laughs> And like finance his eternal quest to find you. This is our therapist of a father. Who yeah, yeah, like he's really catastrophizes us straight away. No, like, no, yeah, like this, this is his way of coping with stuff. It doesn't run in the family at all. I never do it. Shut up. Um, I think we got a little bit off track there, did we? Uh, yeah, this is what to do with the donor. Um, <laughs> that I like getting lost. I like oh, stories, yeah. and you like telling me stories. It's yeah, all, yeah, all basically, basically, getting I, lost in stories. There you yeah. go, buddy. Bringing it, okay. bringing, bringing it back, it back. <laughs> bringing it back. Now tell me, why is the thorn? Why is it this story that's the f- most famous? In, like, if you look up Irish mythology, you pretty much get a series of links to the thorn. It's the most researched. It's the most translated. It's the one that has been done into more modern books than any other version of of myths in Ireland. So, why exactly is that? Do you think? Um. Well, can I first say that I really enjoy the fact that there is a word for cattle raid in Irish. Yeah. Because we say the ton, it's the ton means cattle raid. So mm, that was like, raid. yeah, there's a ton, there's other tons yeah. in, in Irish mythology. Tom but Buff, usually yes. when people talk about the ton, they're talking about the ton book, uh, the cattle raid of Cooley, which is what its kind of full title is. But yeah, no, we had a genuine like quasi military quasi sporting tradition of just going over to your neighbor and rustling his cattle <laughs> and it was called a taunt mm-hmm. and it was like full on lads we're going on a taunt tonight like and it was a kind of a yeah it was just like it was a thing it was a thing that people did um and and I just I, that just tickles me um in terms of why it's the most told i think there's a couple of reasons for that and I think one of them is practical. It's probably the one that we have some of the more complete source material for. I think Laura Nahuera, the Book of the Dun Cow, has, has a pretty complete uh, version of the ton. There's a whole story about how they got it. 
uh, by going through the vo- the the ghost of Fergus McRoy, uh, a poet called Senecon Torpeist, and uh, you know ritually summoning the ghost of Fergus uh, at his burial mound and hearing it like straight from the horse's mouth. So I think the the completeness of it is part of it, uh, and not like you know let's not overlook that because a lot of Irish mythology is missing chunks. Massive, yeah. And part of that is because we developed writing late as a society. Like Greek mythology is very complete, relatively speaking, because they developed a writing system pretty early on. Irish mythology is very fragmented because the opposite happened here. Writing was brought over kind of with Christianity. And so, you know, someone was asking me recently, where is is there any kind of pure, unadulterated by Christianity versions of the Irish mythology? And like there isn't. Because we didn't write them down before the monks came along and we don't know to what extent uh, individual monks tampered with them. Plus, someone recently told me that it was young fellas usually in the monasteries would be like put away into uh, not very well ventilated rooms to write down these stories. that were With, with some nice toxic inks? Yeah. Tripping balls, baby. Tripping balls? Like it like, makes it makes sure. a lot but of stuff make sense. That That also was like, that was not unknown that was not unheard of in terms of the way that poets used to compose things as well in Ireland like there was a bit of a Lotus tradition rooms. of not necessarily a lot of rooms I remember Richard Marsh telling me that they they would be bricked up into a cave and you put they lie down and put a stomach or put a stone on their stomach to stop their their stomach from rumbling to stop the hunger pangs so that they would like so that your stomach doesn't feel empty so they wouldn't be distracted right. and they would lie there until a poem came to them huh and that was like your way of composing poetry. So, mm. I mean, if you think about what fasting does to your mind and your body, it's mm. it's not. And like what that kind of sensory deprivation does to you, that is also like a, a kind of hallucinogenic tradition. It's just not necessarily one where you have to take a psychedelic. Um, so, like, yeah, there's all kinds of questions about the legitimacy of Irish mythology. Sure. I just find it fascinating that out of all of the cycles, the Fina cycle, the king cycle mythological cycle and then the ulster cycle which is obviously of course it's the most well documented one and it's the biggest war really that's documented well, that's the other reason so i said this kind of in my mind there's kind of two main reasons the completeness is one of them uh the other one is i think the role of war in irish culture particularly um in the colonial period mm-hmm. and the kind of war that ku Cullen wages is it's an underdog fight. Yeah. It's one guy against an army and it's an army of, of invaders. Now, it's not really an army of invaders, it's an army of raiders. Like Maeve's army are not coming as conquerors because that wasn't the way that you did things. They're coming to steal one particular bull and whatever else happens to be lying around. But it becomes very useful then psychologically to a people who are under invasion and feel that they are under attack by outsiders Mm. as a kind of a story of defiance and as a story of resilience and as a story of of you know also as a story of let's face it like outright escapism because you have this this like you know one cultural hero who can drive off an entire army and that's what Kukulin does and I suppose it's kind of interesting that in the north Ku Cullen has become a symbol of, well, patriotism for the, uh, what you call it, <laughs> the, the other lads. <laughs> Very uh, articulate. Uh, the, no, the, Ku Cullen has been adopted by both sides in Northern Ireland. Yes, that's what I mean. Uh, sorry. Which is, which is. Brain an, turned off there. Sure did. <clears throat> um, which is, again, it's a really interesting thing because you have, you ha- he's been adopted as a cultural hero by Unionists and nationalists. Unionists was the word I was looking for. Sorry about that. Yeah, so that's kind of mad. Like the fact that you have a symbol of one character that like, and even where it takes place isn't even in Ulster anymore, which is yeah. also funny because Cooley Peninsula. Someone asked me in Athlone there recently. They were like, oh, I'm really confused. Why? Why is it about Ulster? What has to yeah, do with yeah, Ulster? Yeah. He's going to Co- like Louth, like he's going to Louth, <laughs> but Louth was part of Ulster back yeah. in back in the day when the when the story Different was borders. Set. Different borders, and it was a different, it was a different uh, kind of landscape. And I mean, as as you know, I always have to say this, and I apologise to anyone who's listening who has a different view on this question. But Ulster and Northern Ireland are not synonymous. 
Ulster has nine counties in it. Northern Ireland has six counties in it. Yeah. Um. So like, there's a there's a linguistic problem there already. Totally. But yeah, this is a this is a story that I think this happens anytime you have a powerful archetype, though. And I think this is one of the things about mythology that's always something you've got to be a little bit careful with, is that these are powerful stories. They've been told many many times mm-hmm. over many many years there is a kind of an accretion of energy around them from people retelling them and listening to them and investing in them and you know there's all this kind of feel built up around them that's very very potent mm. and if you decide to tap that for a political purpose yeah you can do incredibly destructive things with it because that's also what Podrick Pierce did in the 1916 rising yeah and he did it very explicitly like he he liked he used to retell he was one of the revolutionaries in in 1916 and I think he did it very consciously yeah. because I think he knew I think he knew that he was not supposed to survive the 1916 rising I don't know that he told the other people he was fighting alongside that that was the martyrdom was the goal there yeah um, I mean there's like there's definitely a way to dismantle the hero of Podrick Pierce well, as soon as you look at that because he was essentially telling the Cuchulain story to young men and yeah I mean he was telling the Cuchulain story to children as well in the Pierce Museum or like in what is now the, yeah. the Pierce Museum which was St. Enda's uh, National School like he had kids dressing up and reenacting the Cuchulain story but like that was you know that was that was his inspiration uh, that was in large part his inspiration and I think that's one of the reasons that it be, it was so you know it stayed so alive during the colonial period is because of of that aspect of it it's the warrior who overcomes against all the odds yeah against a great force that seems undefeatable and all yeah. of a sudden one person can stand up and make a difference and of course it makes perfect sense that that, that would be um so i guess uh, desirable for people to kind of inhabit and embody and, and yeah. become so i guess what i kind of want to look at is We've, we've talked about Maeve as this great character this month, especially in one of our live shows, uh, the woman king, the Ban Ri. And a lot of times you see her as a bit of a villain in this story, in some translations and some retellings. You have Queen Maeve who couldn't let it go and had a fight with her husband and said, no, I'm better than you, went off and like caused all this havoc. But like when we went looking at it, we really found... There's just this argument between Aulil and Maeve starts this thing and neither of them can let it go and both fuel this argument. And it's kind of the whole metaphor of anybody who can't let anything go just causes stress and strain and just grows out all around them. I think that's a really interesting theme in the tone because if you think about it, like the the bulls themselves, which is a a story that we'll, we'll release soon, and which is actually at the end, if you listen to Shadows of the Tone, which was our first podcast, the the live one, you'll hear the story of the bulls in that. Um, they are the original entities in in the Tone Book Unla. Mm-hmm. They're the original antagonists. And neither of them is clearly good or bad. This is, for those unfamiliar, this is two swineherds uh, of the two of the Danon. And they are compared to each other that's essentially what starts it they're great friends people start comparing them to each other and then they get into a fight and they get into such a fight that they ruin their lives they get they get each each of them gets the other one fired basically and they get into this fight that they can't let go of but everywhere they go they spread fighting and they spread discord so there's also a kind of an element of fate in this and there's all, like as well as the theme of not letting stuff go there's also kind of an element of this being kind of fated because this bull is bro- is born into Maeve's herds yeah. like right from the get go and like the first thing the bull does is leave Maeve's herds and go into Oliel's herds which is a shit stirring move for stirring a bull. the shit yeah stirring like, the shit Absolutely. so it's like there's already this kind of provocation going on um but yeah, like nobody will let anything go in this. And you also have the the setup story of the, the Sons of Ishnuk, mm-hmm. which we've told on this podcast before, which is what causes the breach of the Ulster Ben. So between like the king not letting go his anger over Deirdre, between like not giving up his honour for Maka, for getting annoyed at her and causing the curse, for having a big 
f- feud and rivalry between it Maeve for many reasons that we found out this mm-hmm. this year, which are well justifies Maeve. You know, in all of her actions, and th- and then even Ku Cullen fighting Ferdy at the Ford, neither of them let go of this honor duty. They're bound to, you know, have to serve their king, and they have to go up and fight yeah. each other. And it's just like this archaic kind of, but I will not stop what I'm doing because I cannot because I said it will go up against you. And yeah, and that's because it. honor. Because honor. A lot of it is because honor. A lot of it is because like I have a status, and if if I allow this insults to go by and my status will be diminished and that's kind of all of them really in, yeah. in one way but I think it's it's also a really interesting thing to pay attention to in the tone is that and you see it you see it a lot in the kind of Kinsella book where he, he has the body counts laid out mm. he has a lot of like so many people died at this place and so many people died at this place and the thing to keep in mind because I think we're a bit in modern culture we're quite desensitised to high body counts Yeah, like we see high body counts all the time you know, you, you watch films, you know, films about from from World War One onwards, you know, whether they're historical or fantasy or, or sci fi or whatever. We're quite used to seeing that spectacle of like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of warriors uh, fighting and dying in these huge cinematic set pieces. Um, and that was not the way of war of the, the Celtic peoples single combat trying to low body count yeah. like if you think if you if you can kind of put yourself mentally back into this place this is a smaller world with a lower population this is a smaller world both because it's a lower population and because you can't travel very far <laughs> and because you're not going to meet many people outside your own tribe and community or outside your own country yeah. so it's a small world and these are big numbers of people dying. Way too big to absorb. Percentage wise rather than Yeah, in terms you know. of percentage of population, like this is a devastating war that is a hugely high cost. And I think that's one of the things that when you're reading this from a modern perspective, it's very easy to lose sight of because mm. you know, there's nine billion people in the world now, we have enough people. If ten thousand of them die, it's fine. Um, I mean, that's probably not. That's it's not like it's clearly not. But but we're we're, wise, we're we're more accustomed yeah. to lots of people dying. We're more accustomed to that kind of statistic brain, mm. where you know if one person dies, it's a tragedy, and a thousand people die, it's a statistic. But in the tone, it's very clearly set out that this is meant to be a tragedy. Mm-hmm. This is not meant to be a good thing. And if you go back to that idea of like you know, are we going on a tone tonight, lads? You know, the cattle raid. It was it was a semi sporting thing. Yeah. You were gonna go out and see if you could sneak into your neighbor's place yeah, and like, like steal some cattle. Modern with, day cow tipping. You know? Without <laughs> getting caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then if you did it to them one week, they'd do it to you the next week yeah, and it would kinda fuckers. like Oh well we get them back, yeah. It yeah. might escalate, but it wouldn't necessarily escalate to the point of a war. Well, that brings me to my, my kind of next point or question is like, so, and I was listening to um, a very good, uh, they're, they're all pretty good at fairness, <laughs> Blind Boy podcast last week where he was talking about, someone asked him about the fascination people have with, with comic book heroes these days, you know, and he, he went on a tangent about, you know, modern adolescents being essentially you know, relived in their 30s and almost 40s. People now kind of having a, a, a coming of age when they're 40 opposed to when they're 16, 17. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's like it's this much older thing that we go back and we hark back and we kind of... Uh, but I think that's that's the dialectic of culture. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that's a big word. But like the, the dialectic is something that you both construct and are constructed by. Right. And... What we tend to do today or what we have started to do today, particularly in Hollywood, because they're profit driven and this is the this is what sells at the moment, is we're telling coming of age stories and we're telling coming of age stories over and over and over again. And this was something that I really kind of started to notice, I think around the third or fourth time Spider-Man was rebooted. I was like, are we ever going to see a Spider-Man movie that isn't an origin story? No. Like ever. Um, And they're like every one of these kind of uh, or a lot of these films are are coming of age stories which is the adolescent kind of journey to maturity but they don't move beyond that but also because they're usually taking the warrior archetype 
and they're having fighting against something to overcome it and essentially going on the hero's journey which is you know the joseph campbell idea that it's like this thing that we're fascinated with coming over with usually using aggression or violence to overcome the opposition and then getting rewarded by the end with the beautiful girl yeah. or and the, the only thing to do with that structure if that's if that's the structure you're taking for the monomyth the only thing to do with it is repeat Mm -hmm. Like if you want to bring back the same character the next time, you have to give them a bigger enemy to defeat. And then they defeat the enemy pretty much the same way. And then they get a reward that's pretty much the same reward. The reward might change slightly, but there's no maturation. There's no moving beyond. So it's it becomes a cycle, uh, which is not actually the intention of, of the monomyth. You're not meant to. Uh, well, no, actually, I, I'm I'm that depends on your interpretation of it and how how much you take it as as a rule. I think the monomyth is a bit re is quite reductive. Actually, it's it's a useful screenwriting tool, but there's not actually much evidence that it's true of the structure of myths, particularly if you move outside of your Greco-European myths. Um, and there are other endings like it's very cherry picked. Yeah. There are very few mythological stories that actually follow all of the points of it. Uh, there are a lot of stories that follow a couple of points of it, mm. and he tends to kind of stitch them all together in order to make the, the full journey. I but mean, I can't remember what your question was about that. <laughs> I mean, I was letting you go to see if it'd come out because basically you worked with a very interesting man, Sandy Dunlop, and he had a great take on this that I'll always yeah. remember from the Bard mythology or Bard School of uh, Mythology over, over in Clare Bard Island. Summer School, yeah. Bard Summer School, uh, where they do a great weekend in July and they basically delve into myth and archetype and all the rest of it. It's fantastic. It's over in Clare Island, which is just one of the best places in Ireland as well. But he had a great take on this idea that we're repeating the warrior myth. Yeah. And, you know, you see it in popular fiction, you see it in popular movies and this constant regurgitation of comic book heroes. It seems to be a very similar thing of just repeating this this warrior archetype. So do you want to tell us what, what, what Sandy's kind of theory was on that? Because I don't want to go off on one. I might get it wrong. I think you'll probably nail it in the head a bit better than me. I don't know. Are you going to ever stop talking? <laughs> We'll cut that out. Sorry. So Sandy's uh, observation about the hero story and the warrior story versus other stories in Irish mythology was kind of based around uh, a piece of research that he read that said that the king stories in Irish mythology used to be a third of the stories that were told. And during the colonial period, that went to almost nothing. And the warrior stories became dominant. Uh, and after the colonial period, we didn't restart telling king stories. And if you think about the function of those stories, like, you know, we've talked about the Cucullin story already in terms of it being an underdog story. And it's a story of getting one over and it's a story of rebellion. It's a story of resistance. And it's a story of like young person going against, you know, a, an invasion uh, but it's not a story of kind of mature governance and, you know, sitting on your throne and doing right by your people. And his idea, I guess, about the, the king stories, and this is kind of more to do with the king stories in Irish myth, there's a, there's a branch of stories that are all to do with kings. And they're all to do with, uh, you know, the centralization, the decentralization of power. And they're all to do with the pitfalls of power. So if you think of the stories like Conor Moore, mm. where he, if he puts his family above the, the country, a terrible curse is brought down on him. And that's kind of a lot of the problem that we have in Ireland with, you know, if you think of our political system, it's very, very, very regionalistic. Um, we don't have a strong tradition of this is what's best for the country as a whole. Mm. This is what's best for the larger, like, and sometimes a small group of people have to be inconvenienced to help everybody else. Um, we don't really have that because we, you know, because we don't tell the king stories and we don't tell stories of mature leadership. And I think that's part of the, the kind of the thing that, maybe blind boy was getting at as well is that like we we just tend to stay in these somewhat adolescent stories and it's not that they don't have a place mm -hmm. and it's not that they're not great 
And like if you look at the ton and if you look at the warrior cycle of the ton, this is not a good story about what a nice time everybody had. And it's not like a story of, oh, look how cool, you know, they're like, because it is, you know, it's cool and it's clashy and it's bashy and it's battly and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the point of it. It's not the Valerie's Cucullin. Yeah, like there's an argument that I often make, which is that Cucullin has a miserable life. Yeah, it sounds like in fairness. Like, sure, he has glory, but he has, a, he pays an incredibly terrible price mm. for the glory. And I think that that's very clearly kind of, that's not, to me, much of a read into the text of the tone. I think it's kind of pretty much right there. Yeah, it's on the nose. It's it's pretty on the nose. It's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's pretty clear. It's pretty explicit. He kills his best friend. He kills his own son. You know, he doesn't really seem to have much crack. Yeah, uh, he doesn't have many friends. He never makes a lot of friends. Leg is like the only dude who talks to him. Leg is the only person who talks to him, and Leg is Leg is the only person who like has a uh, any kind of a relationship that seems to be friendly with him. But he's he's one of those the, like the character of him is like he's good at everything. So why would you, he's one of those brilliant, amazing thing? He like everything he does, he's just oh look at him being brilliant. How would you hang out with him and have have a laugh? Exactly. Yeah. Be shy, shy crack. Uh, yeah, the kind of child prodigy problem, like. So yeah, that's Sandy's. That was Sandy's theory of king versus warrior stories. And I think one of the things about the tone that is interesting to me is that we tend to valorize warrior stories a lot. And I think part of that is also like cinema is a visual medium. So you want big set pieces of like hundreds and hundreds of aliens getting blown up. Like that's that's like that's like exciting to watch. And again, I guess like it does glamorize the the archetype of the warrior, which makes it like, like you know, you're constantly va valorizing uh, violence. And this that like it's kind of scary to look back at the last hundred years and you said something there earlier, earlier, we're not telling the stories of the kings. And you're like, hang on, does that really make a difference? Like, does it really make a difference what stories you grow up with? Does it really make a difference what story, like how, how important is a story to a culture? But then you start looking into it and you start realizing that, Jesus, it's fairly fitting it's important. Really important. Actually, Sandy has a very interesting video called The Myth of Trump, which we might link in the show notes of this because he goes into how Trump in the States used the the myths of of uh, American culture in his mm -hmm. speeches in order to get elected. Like the main dominant kind of cultural myths, that was what he kind of worked with. Um, and, you know, actually has, has quite a good style as a classical orator. Yeah. <laughs> Whether the consciously or... Well, accept like, that. Consciously or not, but that's yeah. that's why he's popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's popular because he he speaks in he speaks in uh, he's he's a good he you know he's a, he's a good storyteller again begrudgingly. <laughs> yeah. Because he tells very clear stories and he repeats them over and over and over again until people get used to hearing them and then they start thinking that they're true, because that's how storytelling works. Mm. And that's why he's so such dominant force in politics over there because. He doesn't really care if his if his stories are true or not. I mean, I'm the first to say never, never let truth get in the way of a good story. But when it's I know, but this <sighs> is God damn it. this is the danger of this is the danger of only telling certain stories. Mm -hmm. This is the danger of only telling invasion and uh, rebellion stories. Yeah. Because if you only tell invasion and rebellion stories, and then somebody comes along and says, "Hey, all of your problems are because of an invasion. Let's rebel," you'll go cool. Whereas if people are telling stories about, you know, how a good leader behaves and what happens to a leader who puts himself and his family before the, the common good. Mm. And you're used to hearing that story. And then you sudden. see this fucker coming along, yeah. riding over the hill, promising deliverance. You, you then have a bit more of a framework in your head to go, well, hang on a second. What's really going on? What else is going on here? Yeah, because it's like, you know, kids learn th third person perspective from storytelling like quite literally you know you, you get to about three or four and all of a sudden you, you, you develop this th third 
person perspective that you didn't have before mm-hmm. because everything is locked down in your your point of view and nothing happens outside of that until you eventually learn a bit of empathy and figure out that other people have emotions and cognitions and thoughts and all that kind of stuff going on outside of you but you you learn it through stories and and it's kind of interesting to to to, to go into the depth of how important a, a story can actually can be for for a culture because essentially culture can be defined as the stories that a group of people tell together mm-hmm. so if you want to change and we're in i think a kind of a very interesting time in ireland at the moment because it's our, our culture is being created and recreated and, and added to and it's it's developing as every culture is all of the time and you know you're you're looking at it and going okay our culture is is adapting and and molding with what's going on around us yet we'll still go back and retell these old stories to a new audience and it'll land differently and what someone said to me last week was we're not telling these stories the way they're written down and it kind of something clicked in my head is like well you know they didn't get a chance to develop they didn't get a chance to kind of modernize all that much because they they were told for a long 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 time as an oral tradition and then they kind of got chopped and stuck in this kind of like little time bubble. Well, see, I think that's interesting because I, I, I don't know that that's... I think we're, we're coming at that slightly backwards because okay. I think it's actually kind of a gift to us that they were... that the, the, Like, from a certain perspective because oral, oral traditions that are still extant in the world are mm. extremely conservative. You don't change a word mm. because everybody knows the story. And the storyteller will tell it from memory and it will be perfectly recited. And if they drop a line or they forget a bit, the audience will shout it out to them because everybody knows the story. So they're actually quite resistant to change okay. in places where they exist. What you tend to get is you tend to get different versions of the story in different regions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we got, because they were written down at a certain point and because the the story, the oral storytelling tradition itself you know, around the world has, has atrophied to a certain extent everywhere. Um, you end up with a, a fragmented tradition. And I think there's there's positives and negatives to that. Like, obviously, we'd all love to know what exactly was the story of Fionn McGoo when it was first told. Yeah. But like, we can't have that. What we can have is what we have. And what we can do with that, because there's space around it, and because there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of contradictions and a lot of like different versions say different things is we have a freedom then to do a certain amount of interpretation and artistic license and characterization and bring kind of modern techniques and sensibilities to the stories that we probably wouldn't like we'd probably, I mean I'm pretty sure we would have been excommunicated from excommunicated from any like Breton storytelling guild by now because of the the general like you know we'll take a serious story and we'll make it a comedy because we think it's hilarious like you know we do that a lot um or we'll take a story and like you know flip tell it, it head and we'll have flip look. it on its head tell it from a different person's yeah. perspective yeah. 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 all that kind of freedom that we have it, we have because the the there was a disruption um, so I don't think it's necessarily something to be super like upset about no I'm not upset about it I'm, <laughs> I'm just I, I, you know it, it's a it's a it's a light bulb of like oh well like we're looking back we are shining a light on stuff and we're, we are bringing it back and speaking of shining lights on stuff and bringing stuff back we'll I'm excited to to do the bull story properly and uh, we'll be recording that as a podcast over the winter break and we'll have another brief scale to what did we say we do I think we said we do the training with Scott. Oh yeah, because again, she was one of the great warriors who trained Cú Cullen and she's been left out. So mm-hmm. we're kind of on a bit of a mission to bring back that great character and that great um, trainer of Cú Cullen, I guess. So we want to just, you know, take the ingredients of the stories that we know about her and make her the centre character, not just have her uh, kind of pop in al- along the Cú Cullen story and just be a sideline character. So we're we're going to do those pretty soon but I think we've had a long enough chat now we, this is our only podcast that we've released without a story so hey let us know what you think uh, let us know if you know the background noise annoyed you or if you heard it at all nah uh, nobody heard that if my very husky 
crud like voice annoyed you sorry I, about that I don't think if anyone was going to be annoyed by huskiness of voice they wouldn't have listened beyond the first yeah, of yeah, the yeah. Dawn episodes because we both had a cold that week <laughs> sorry sorry about that sorry about that not um, sorry that's life man that's life that's just, life just deal with it <laughs> and I'm telling you last week the PA was broke inside the stag's head and we were like celebrating our fifth year going telling stories and we were just giving it welly and the fiddle was going and Rue was playing guitar and it was great cracking shouty 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 and I was in the school the following morning telling tell back to back half hour stories to the entire school and by the end of it I was like I can't talk anymore mm. I just had to bring him on now and go okay we're going to tell you an old story there lads I'm going to tell it in a whisper because my voice got me <laughs> and and got really me. dramatic whispers because that's what we have to do for our stories anyway if you're interested in being a patron, you can find us on patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. This podcast is brought to you by you, the listener. So if you're not a supporter of Patreon, that's grand. Share it, uh, spread it, uh, learn the story, tell it, keep it alive, that kind of thing. I've, uh, well, Oshin Ryan was probably going to edit and. He's something. definitely gonna have to do something. We'll he'll make him do something. Do, he'll, he'll do something. I'm not we'll sure. We'll make what him he'll do, do something. I don't know. He, 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 Listen, he, he, if he's not sure doing anything whatever. podcast related, we also still wouldn't be able to cope yeah. without Oshin doing stuff. So and there's just a rake of people that we constantly collaborate with and help with, get help from. So look, that's that's the crack. So thanks to everybody, uh, including yourself, for listening. Is there anything else I left out now for this one? She's gone into a very strange facial expression. I'm thinking. Um, I mean, I just wanted to describe what's going on. It was quite an interesting facial reaction that you had there now. Uh, yeah, she's doing the old tap. No, do you know what? I'm tired. <laughs> Fuck it. Turn it off. Listen, Ihoa, go to Mila Magriff and have a cup of tea because we're going to have one now. Hey. And uh, we'll chat to you next time. Actually, we decided to have a little postscript to this podcast because it's solstice. So, uh, happy solstice. We hope you're keeping well and warm. It's the darkest day of the year and it's a bit dark out there and gloomy. And we wanted to apologise as well and explain the fact that we didn't quite get our five part podcast released over five weeks, which was the initial plan because it was our fifth birthday. But that didn't really work out because, uh, well, we misplaced a few files. We confused Oshin. <laughs> and Oshin's here with me now. Sorry, Oshin. Ah, well, I mean, some of the weeks had eight days and some of the weeks had nine days. <laughs> you were, yeah, and we, we're, we're going start. with an ancient calendar yeah. approach on this one. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. It was open to interpretation. What is a week, huh? Well, and when did we decide it was... Anyway, well, let's not go down that road. We just want to say sorry, um, but thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying the podcast. We hope you enjoyed this one. It was just talking, no stories, so there'll be more stories as well. There'll be more sleep stories for the Patreon users as well. We're just going to start putting up readings out of Lady Gregory and older books that are gone out of uh, copyright, I guess. They're yeah. allowed to do that sort of thing. So that'll just be kind of like stuff you can fall asleep to. Um... Anything else, Oshin? I just want to thank all the people that listen. Yeah. Thank that's... all the Patreons that patronise us. <laughs> Patreonise us. Patr- patronate us. Uh, patronate. Yes. <laughs> definitely not the word. Um, yeah, all our patrons. Patrons. That's patrons. it. Um, I always fuck that up. Thanks again, guys. We'll be having more podcasts in the new year and we'll have a bit more music, a bit more different styles of stuff and we're going to be experimenting with a few things. In January, we're going to have uh, Fan Sheen Sound, a collaboration with uh, Sound Bath expert teacher gong artist Rue O'Shea, our one and only. And that'll be interesting. That'll be in uh, in Ranala Yoga Studio. So if you're looking out for that. And of course, we're gearing up for her story on the 1st of February 2nd of February in the Sugar Club so there's tickets galore you can follow us and find us and all that kind of crack online and I hope you're keeping warm keeping safe keeping happy and keeping those stories lit good night